Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to talk about all of the books that I have acquired in the months of September and October. If you are an OG subscriber to my channel, you will know that starting in, I want to say 2020, I decided to make a very heavy concerted effort to lower down my physical TBR. And because of that, I made some very strict rules on what I was or was not allowed to purchase because I did not want my TBR to get to the point where I had these books sitting on there for years that I was losing interest in and I was finding that's what was happening more often than not. I don't mind having a large TBR, but if I have a large physical TBR and I lose interest in these books, those are books that I've purchased that I'm no longer interested in and I kind of feel like it's a waste of money. So I wanted to be more intentional. And over the past couple of years, I have absolutely done that. I've really only been bringing in books that I have read and want to keep on my shelves with the exceptions of special editions that I wanted to go ahead and snag or my book of the month books. And now my physical TBR is very, very anemic. My physical TBR fits on a half bookcase that is actually just right here and it's not even full. I have one and a half empty shelves that can be filled. I do plan on beefing it up a little bit over the next couple of months, but I'm just saying all this as kind of a caveat that I don't imagine big book hauls to be a thing on my channel very often. And a lot of the book hauls that I am going to do are going to be primarily of books that I have already read and wanted to acquire for my bookshelves. I just kind of want to be a model for an advocate for conscientious consumerism. I don't want to blindly purchase things. I really want things that I bring into my home to be mindful purchases that I'm going to love and use and want to keep. And I'm definitely extending that mindset towards books. Anyway, enough of the rambling. Let's go ahead and get into why you're really here. So for the first two weeks of September, Robert and I were actually on a vacation. We road tripped to Washington, DC, then to New York, and then Boston. While we were in the DC, Virginia area, I was actually able to meet up with Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand. She's one of my favorite booktubers. I've been following her for many years and we have been able to strike up a friendship over my time on booktube. And so I was so happy to get to meet her and we did go to this little independent bookshop that was in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia. And while I was there, I was able to find a signed copy of Forging Silver into Stars by Bridget Kemmerer. I honestly don't know the specifics of what this is about. I just know that it is set in like the same world of Emberfall as her Curse Breakers trilogy, which I have not finished. I have read the first two books. I still need to read the third one and I'm kind of nervous to do so based on the direction that it was headed at the end of book two, but I'm excited to get to this. It is a stunning edition. And like I said, it's signed. The signature is here. And so I couldn't pass this up and I wanted to go ahead and get it. And I thought that there is now a special memory attached to this one because I got it while on my vacation and getting to shop with a good booktube friend of mine. And then of course, while I was in New York, I couldn't leave New York without visiting The Strand, which is a very famous bookshop that is in New York. And I will admit that I found the bookstore very overwhelming. I should have gone in with a plan of things to look for and I just didn't. <laughs> but I did end up with one thing. I ended up with Hamilton The Revolution. It's kind of a tell-all from Lin-Manuel Miranda about his creation of the Hamilton musical and there are pictures and things of that nature. Nature, so I'm very excited to get into this and learn more about it. I'm only a recent convert to Hamilton. I'm very late to the game. I only saw it for the first time in June when it came to New Orleans and I've been obsessed ever since. I just love the music. I love the message behind it. I just love everything about it and so I wanted to get it and I figured hey they had it at the Strand. What better place to get this book than in New York where you know basically it all started. So I'm very happy to have this and look forward to reading it physically one day. This next stack I'm not going to really go into too much detail about because these are all books that I read in September and so they are in my September wrap-up. I will link it up in the cards for you so you can check that out if you want to hear more of my thoughts on these books. First I have As Good As Dead by Holly Jackson. This is the final book in the A Good Girl's Guide to Murder trilogy. Next I have Big Lies in a Small Town by Diane Chamberlain. This is a historical fiction that takes place in two timelines, one in 1939 and one in 2018. Next I have The Lost Girls of Willowbrook by Ellen Marie Wiseman. This is also a historical fiction that is set in the 1970s and it is based on the actual Willowbrook State School in New York that was notorious for the neglect and abuses of the people that actually were patients here. And so the overall concept of this was great. I didn't necessarily love the execution. Again, you can hear more of my in-depth thoughts in that September wrap-up, but I did find it to be a memorable story and I would be willing to read more from Ellen Marie Wiseman in the future. This one just wasn't perfect for me. Then I have two that go together. They are the first two in a series. I have The Defense, 
and The Plea, both by Steve Cavanaugh. This is the start of his Eddie Flynn series. Eddie Flynn is a defense attorney and it is all about the shenanigans that he gets himself into or more aptly the shenanigans that find him as a defense attorney. I find that these are very clever, well done, intricately woven, complex stories. They are very engaging and they are very fast paced. They will keep you entertained. So if you are looking for great legal thrillers, I highly recommend picking this up. I am intrigued to continue in this series and I'm very intrigued to read more from Steve Kavanaugh as an author. And then next we have the book of the month books that I have acquired in September and October. First I have When We Were Bright and Beautiful by Jillian Medoff. My understanding is that this is kind of a family saga. It is a privileged family and what happens when one of the sons of this family is accused of rape. I believe the main character of this story is the sister and her absolute belief in his innocence. And I don't know the direction that this is going to take. I don't know if he is guilty or not guilty or what is actually going to unfold in the story, but it sounded like it was going to be a beautiful family type of drama and I'm here for it. Next, I picked up the book of the month copy of Invisible Girl by Lisa Jewell. Lisa Jewell is quickly becoming one of my favorite thriller suspense authors. I've read three of her books this year and I have really enjoyed all of them. And so I definitely want to read more of her backlist and anything that comes out in the future. I don't know too much about this. Let me go ahead and read you what it says. Owen Pick's life is falling apart. In his 30s, a virgin and living in his aunt's spare bedroom, he has just been suspended from his job as a computer science teacher after accusations of sexual misconduct, which he strongly denies. Searching for professional advice online, he is inadvertently sucked into the dark world of incel, involuntary celibate forums where he meets the charismatic, mysterious, and sinister Bryn. Across the street from Owen live the Forrest family. Headed by mom Kate, a physiotherapist, and dad Rowan, a child psychologist, Kate and Rowan have always had bad feelings about their neighbor Owen. There's something off about him. Meanwhile, young Sapphire Maddox spent three years as a patient of Rowan Force. Feeling abandoned when their therapy ends, she searches for other ways to maintain her connection with him, trailing him when he leaves his practice, and learning more than she wanted to know about Rowan. Then on Valentine's night, Sapphire disappears, and the last person to see her alive is Owen Pick. Okay, so this actually sounds like there are going to be multiple characters and multiple threads. So this sounds like it could have like one of those intricately complicated woven storylines. I'm definitely here for it. I'm here to see what Lisa Jewell does with this story. Like I said, she is quickly becoming one of my favorite thriller suspense authors. And so I'm down to read whatever she writes. Next, I have Killers of a Certain Age by Deanna Rayborn. This is another one that I'm really intrigued by and would like to get to soon. What I understand, this follows four older women. I believe that they are in their 60s. And for the past 40 years, they have been deadly assassins. They have been members of the museum, which is a network of highly skilled trained assassins. But now they are older. They are kind of being phased out. Nobody really appreciates their methods. They're considered old school. And so they are retiring and they are sent on this like retirement cruise. But they soon realize that they are being targeted and they know that the only people that could have hired them to be taken out were their own network. So now on the one hand, they are fighting for their own lives, but then they are probably going to turn around and be killers of the killers. So I'm highly intrigued to get into this one. This sounds absolutely fantastic. Next, I have Blacktop Wasteland by S.A. Cosby. Y'all know that I read Razorblade Tears a few weeks ago and absolutely loved it. And it made me eager to read S.A. Cosby's backlist and of course, anything he writes in the future. This follows our main character who goes by Bug. And at the start of the story, he is a settled man. He is a loving husband. He is a devoted father, but he has definitely had a life of crime. I believe he's been a wheel man in like heist situations and he left that all behind. However, he is getting to a point of desperation. And when a former associate approaches him with a jewelry store heist, he doesn't really feel like he can say no. So I feel like this is about him and him going back to his life of crime and him kind of struggling with the man he was, with the man that he is now. I have a feeling that this is also going to have some poignant thoughts about race and poverty in the United States, just like Razorblade Tears did. I didn't feel like when S.A. Cosby did it in Razorblade Tears that it was very in your face, very heavy handed or anything like that. I felt like it was very factually stated and I appreciated his thoughts and his observations on the matter. And so I'm very intrigued to see what he does with this story. And I'm here for it. Next, I have Spells for Forgetting by Adrienne Young. I have only read one book by Adrienne Young. It was Fable, and I really enjoyed that. And this, I believe, is her first adult novel. This is definitely giving me very atmospheric, witchy, kind of wicked deep vibes by Shay Earnshaw only for the adult age range. Let me go ahead and read to you what this is about. Emery Blackwood's life changed forever the night her best friend was found dead and the love of her life, August Salt, was accused of murdering her. Years later, she is doing what her teenage self swore she never would, living a quiet existence on the misty remote shores of Sawars Island. Ooh, I don't think I pronounced that right. And running the family's business, Blackwood's tea shop, herbal tonics, and tea leaf readings. But when the island, rooted in folklore and magic, begins to show signs of strange happenings, Emery knows that something is coming. The morning she wakes to find that every single 
single tree has turned color in a single night. August returns for the first time in 14 years and unearths the past that the town has tried desperately to forget. I don't want to really read much more than that. This just sounds so magical and atmospheric and even kind of witchy. And I absolutely am looking forward to diving into this one. Like I said, I really enjoyed Fable. I don't have any other experience with Adrian Young, but I'm excited to see what she does with this story. Next, I decided to pick up Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. So Gabrielle Zevin has been an author I have been intrigued by for a very long time, but have never actually decided to pick anything up. Because when I read the synopsis of her books, they're like, hmm, that sounds kind of good. That sounds interesting, but never, there's not enough pull for me to pick them up and read them. This book has been getting so much hype and so much buzz that I thought it might be the perfect entryway into her books. And if I do enjoy this, maybe I would like to go ahead and dive into her backlist. I know that one of them, The Story Life of A.J. Fickery, is a really popular book here on BookTube and it's getting an adaptation. And that might be another one I want to dive into, but I wanted to go ahead and start with this one. My understanding is that this follows two childhood friends who might have like separated at some point in their lives and they end up running into each other on the subway in New York. And it ends up leading to a major collaboration on a game that kind of sweeps the world. And so by the time they are in their mid twenties, they are rich, they are successful, they are living their best lives. And I believe this story actually follows them and their friendship over the course of 30 years. And I really enjoy those stories. I'm a very character driven reader. And so I love stories that dive deeply into character dynamics, their relationships, the complexities that go along with that. I'm here for it. And if that's what this book is, I have a feeling that I'm going to love it. I know a couple of booktubers that I watch have really enjoyed this story. And so I trust them and I'm excited to go ahead and get into this one. Next, I have The Family Game by Katherine Stedman. I have never read anything by this author before, but I was really intrigued by the plot of this and I wanted to go ahead and give it a shot. So this says that it's following Harriet Reed. She is a novelist and she is newly engaged to Edward Holbach, who is the heir of a powerful family. And he has long tried to sever ties with them, but news of the couple's imminent marital bliss has the Holbachs inching back into their lives. As Harriet is drawn into their lavish world, the family seems perfectly welcoming. So when Edward's father, Robert, hands Harriet a tape of a book he's been working on, she's eager to listen. But as she presses play, it's clear that this isn't just a novel. It's a confession. A confession to a grisly crime, a murder, and suddenly the game is in motion. Feeling isolated and confused, Harriet must work out if this is part of a plan to test her loyalty or something far darker. What is it that Robert sees in her? Why give her the power to destroy everything? This sounds really interesting. I'm not only interested to hear what the confession is, but I'm interested to hear what the motive is behind giving our main character this tape. So it sounds like this is going to be dark, twisted, family secrets. I am definitely intrigued to get into this one. Next, I have Maybe Someday by Colleen Hoover. Y'all know that I am a huge, ginormous Colleen Hoover fan. I love almost everything she writes. I don't think I've ever rated one of her books less than four stars. She is incredible to me. I just find that she has a way of writing characters and relationships. And she also includes a lot of harder hitting topics in her books. There's always at least one harder hitting theme that the characters are trying to overcome and deal with. And I feel like she does it very well. I always feel very connected to and invested in her characters and their relationships and the romance. I find some of them to be very raw and harrowing. And I don't know a whole heck of a lot about this one, but I don't really need to because it is Colleen Hoover. I know that there is going to be a romance. There's probably going to be something angsty about this romance. And that, that's really all I need, y'all. Just place a Colleen Hoover in my hand and I will read it. No questions asked. I should also say that this was one of the books that was sent to me for October's monthly gifting. I am part of a Facebook group that does a monthly book exchange. This was definitely one that I was excited to get. So definitely looking forward to this one. Next, I have this beautiful illustrated edition of Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. I'm going to finally be diving into Robin Hobb in November. I'm going to be buddy reading this book and I'm excited to have somebody to share the experience with. I'm a little bit intimidated, not necessarily because it is a long series overall, but it's more like I consider myself fairly new to adult fantasy. I've only been reading adult fantasy for the past couple of years. And even then I've only read a handful and I consider Robin Hobb to be a fairly classic fantasy author and I'm just not sure if it's going to be for me. I'm not sure if I'm going to love it as much as everybody else does but after seeing Becca and Cody's recent vlogs as they finish the series it just really made me want to experience what they are experiencing. I want to fall in love with these characters too. I want to get invested so I'm absolutely going to be giving this a shot. I'm going to be reading this physically in November and I hope to maybe annotate it and just really get lost in this world if I can and then hopefully continue with it. Next I have The Escape Room by Megan Golden. 
and I picked this up because I really enjoyed the Night Swim by her and I did end up reading this in August. I didn't love it as much as the Night Swim but I felt like it was overall pretty solid. So this is set over two timelines. In the present timeline you were following four colleagues. They are lawyers at this very prestigious highly competitive law firm and they are called last minute to this mandatory meeting. They don't know what it's about at all. They are very inconvenienced by this but they all decide to show up because they kind of feel like their jobs might be on the line. There's being some like layoffs and cutbacks and restructuring. They just don't know what's happening. They show up and they think that it might be some kind of team building exercise and when they get on the elevator to go up to the meeting the elevator actually stops and they feel like they might be in an escape room and sure enough clues start showing up on the monitor in the elevator and so they think as long as they solve the clues they'll get out but that's not the case. It soon becomes really apparent that they are not in an actual escape room and somebody is messing with them and somebody is trying to make this a very unpleasant experience like they are turning up the heat way high and then they're turning on the air conditioning way low and so you're following them and you're starting to realize that these are not great people and they're hiding a lot of secrets and they really don't like each other and so all of this stuff is coming out they're becoming the worst versions of themselves and you're really following them as they are deteriorating in this situation and then in the past timeline you were following Sarah Hall who was a former colleague of these four and I don't really want to say much more about that because the past timeline definitely has a lot to do with the present timeline so I don't want to risk giving away the connection from the past to the present. I really enjoyed the past timeline more than I did the present. I didn't really care for the present just because I didn't like the four characters that are stuck in the elevator and you're not really meant to. They're really not great people at all. I really did feel like the escape room aspect of this could have been done a lot better. I felt like that was really secondary to it. Like there weren't very many clues included in the escape room. I felt like that part of it could have been done up so much better to make it actually feel more like an escape room situation. So I appreciated more the perspective of Sarah Hall and everything that she goes through. So this was okay. I think I gave it a three, 3.5 stars. I'm definitely intrigued to read more from Megan Golden, especially since The Night Swim is a more newer release and this is older and I like The Night Swim more. So I feel like if I continue to read her newer works, maybe they will get better over time. So again, three, 3.5 stars, nothing mind blowing, but solid overall. And then lastly, I have this beautiful illustrated edition of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. This is the fifth book in the series and the most recently released illustrated edition by Jim Kay. I have been collecting these because I find that they are stunning and a great way to revisit the series. So I'm glad to have this and can add it to my collection. Highly recommend, especially if you have children that you are trying to introduce to the series, to pick up the illustrated editions because they are gorgeous. All right, y'all, that is it. Those are all the books that I've acquired in September and October. Please let me know if you have read any of these and what your thoughts are. Please let me know if there are any that I have haven't read that you feel like I should prioritize I would love to know and as always if you like this video or if you just like me please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already because I would sure love to see you in my next video bye guys